Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. Katrin Ostler is yeah. an author, journalist who has been editor-in-chief of Tatler, the Evening Standard magazine, editor of Times Weekend. She also written for a wide range of other publications, including the Financial Times, Vogue, and Newsweek. She read English at Oxford University, specializing in 18th century literature. Now, good morning. We are here with your new book, The Hunters, The Simon and Schuster. One of our friends, author Simon Stebeck Montefiore, defines this book utterly gripping, a fascinating woman in a dazzling world, soaked in sex, money, and ambition. Now, why, Catherine Osler, you decided to dedicate this very long biography to this woman, the Duchess Countess? Can you tell us a little bit of the background of this project? Yes, yeah, sure. Well, I actually came across her as a character in a book by Simon Seabag Montefiore, his rather brilliant book on Catherine the Great and Potemkin, in which he describes this woman sailing up the Neva into St. Petersburg on an extraordinary yacht full of kind of monkeys and parrots and an orchestra. And she was a very over-the-top character. And he wrote how she'd fled London in disgrace and she was determined to become friends with Catherine the Great. And in order to facilitate an introduction, she'd sent two masterpiece paintings ahead to one of Catherine's allies. And she managed to be invited to the Summer Palace where she was received with great ceremony. And I'd never heard of her then, so I started looking into it. And it was um, a period of history that always appealed to me. Uh, You mentioned how I um, read English and I was sort of, gripped by and how I edited Tatler and Tatler was founded in sort of 1709 and it was one of the publications that marked the birth of the British press which burgeoned throughout the 18th century. So I was fascinated by this woman and her scandal and her sort of courage in the face of adversity but also by the period which is the birth of modern Britain really but is much undercovered in the British curriculum, where the history in British schools very much focuses on the Tudors, who have this sort of very alluring bloodlust, and then it sort of skips and goes on to the Victorians with their, you know, their sort of comprehensible commerciality. But there's this great block in the middle where so much of what we know happens, the beginning of the British Museum, the rise of the British Navy that leads to empire, the beginning of the importance of Parliament, really, with the long reign of Walpole, and also this fantastically sort of bitchy, gossipy kind of literature of Swift and Pope, which is what originally drew me in. This woman, she was born in a good family, I mean, but without money. She lost her father when she was very young, and then she lost her brother when she was a bit older. So she had no money and no real social protection, right? but she was uh, driven probably by a great ambition. I mean, certainly by a great ambition not to have at least a banal existence in the countryside, right? Yes. Mm. You use the word career, though, because I think actually you sort of hit on something, which is there were no options for women then at all. In that, in her class, which is sort of gentry, upper middle class, but no money, Slightly, you might have quite a good education at home in the domestic setting, but it wouldn't really get you anywhere. There was one career available, really, which was at court, and she became a maid of honour. But in terms of survival, as we know from the novels of Jane Austen, say, it was marriage or nothing. So something it's very easy to forget is this sort of suffocating, claustrophobic world that women lived then. She is a lady of honour at the court, right? Because she's beautiful, well-mannered, and she was well introduced. That's why she becomes the countess, right? Because she marries this sailor, this 
man who is not the eldest one, is the second child, right? And they marry secretly for a long, for two years around the world on a boat, which is the beginning of her scandalous life somehow. Yes, I think it's like one of those turning points in an Ian McEwan novel where in a split second, the whole course of the rest of her life and his life actually changes where it should have been a summer holiday romance. They're in this incredibly beautiful setting where I went. It's now a hotel in Hampshire and it's the most perfect Queen Anne house. It's a red brick with an exquisite garden full of roses and this long line of lime trees that goes on. It's the longest avenue of lime trees in England, and it goes through this valley outside Winchester. And there's this ancient medieval chapel, which is now in ruins. But you could easily imagine how you might get caught up in the heat of the moment and make this terrible mistake. But part of the problem was the marriage laws in England, which were so unclear as to what constituted a legal marriage and what didn't, in that... So lots of the laws that now surround British marriage came into effect, partly because of her, nine years after this ceremony, where in an English wedding, you have to have two witnesses. You have to have the bands read in your parish a few weeks before you do it. The church door, if it's in church, has to be left open so it's a public event. Now, none of that existed then. So as long as you could find somebody, a priest, or even someone who just said they were a priest, you could just sort of get married. And people made terrible mistakes all the time. I was very amused to discover that 50% of these clandestine weddings involved a sailor, as it did in her case, because they were so desperate before they went to sea and they didn't care. They thought they might get killed in the West Indies or whatever, because they often did, that they just sort of wed these women. (laughs) But uh, even if she's married, she continues her life at court, right? And he's away and she is flirting here and there. (laughs) Then he comes back, but they don't get really together, right? No, well, they sort of briefly reunite. So the problem is they, they both want to lie because he's a penniless sailor at the time, even though, as you say, he's the sort of his older brother will be an earl, but he doesn't have any money. And you can't be a maid of honor at court if you're married, it's only available to single women. So it's in both their interests to lie. And in order to keep up the lie that she's still single so she can draw her salary, she sort of has to carry on flirting with all the other men at court. So then she starts getting proposals and turning them down and no one understands what on earth she's doing. And then he comes back after two years, by which time they've completely sort of gone off each other, really. He was a terrible womanizer before he even met her. His name later in life becomes the English Casanova. Later on, she finds this duke, right? And she has a long affair with the duke yes and in the same time she makes him jealous because they are not married and he she goes here and there in various courts from the court of frederick in uh, potsdam or she goes to baden baden she has that kind of mundane life right yeah she's very adventurous and she's a sort of thrill-seeking hypochondriac as well i mean There's a very sad episode in which uh, she has a baby in secret and it dies. And after that, she's never quite the same again, even though she ends up marrying the Duke and she falls this man and falls mad enough with this man. She is always trying to seek something that will make her feel better, be it sort of validation or the protection of a foreign court or a spa. But people speculated that she travelled to make him jealous and... It did make him jealous, actually, because he was very loyal to her for over 20 years. He was the Duke of... um... Duke of Kingston. He was the second and last Duke of Kingston. His um, grandfather had been a lawyer and a courtier, and his father had died young of smallpox. He was a very wealthy man, right? He was extremely wealthy. He, uh, he, When his father died, he'd gone on a sort of 10-year grand tour, but he'd had these three rather brilliant trustees who look up, looked after his estates, and they made it the most profitable estate in England. She had an allowance from him that she could travel and spend all his money, or how did she manage to have such an extravagant life? It's not quite clear, but we think that he paid for it. But she also became an entrepreneur in her own right, really. He would give her money, but she became a sort of property developer. 
So she bought a plot of land in Mayfair in Hill Street and she built a house and then sold it five years later. And that was something she would sort of repeat all over Europe later in life without the successful sale, actually. She was rather better at spending money than making it. What did she look like? Was she very pretty? What was the attraction of this woman? Oh, she was, she was very beautiful. Yes, Joshua Reynolds painted her, and he was still talking 30 years later about how she was the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen. Sadly, that painting doesn't survive. There's only, there was a sketch, an, an engraving of the painting, which is it was in one of Horace Walpole's diaries. But she was sort of small, with kind of browny fair hair and blue eyes, but her appeal was meant to be that she was also very charismatic and a great wit, by which I mean not that she was necessarily funny, but that she was very sort of sharp and amusing conversationalist. And how did she manage to go from one court to the other, to be invited? Well, she was a sort of classic sort of soft power merchant, a bit of a female Machiavelli type. And what she did was she became very good friends with one very important person, the electress of the Dowager Electress of Saxony. Um, and she sort of introduced herself to her by representing Augusta, the Princess of Wales, George III's mother, who never became queen. And so she sort of leveraged one powerful relationship into another. So she would say, oh, I come here and I send greetings from Augusta, which, of course, you could do then because, you know, it would take months to get a letter and nobody could sort of tell you know, the truth of what you were doing. I mean, she was very close to Augusta. So she becomes friends with the Electress of Saxony. And then once you're in one court in Europe, of course, they're all interrelated. Then you're sort of in, into all of them. You know, the British royal family then being German. And, you know, of course, Catherine the Great was a German princess. And the Electress mm. was great friends with the Pope. So from there, she got the Electress to introduce her to everybody else. And so she sort of traded off the fact she was the friends of this. German electress. They say that she was dressing in a very scandalous way and uh, that uh, this was something that um, was looked with great fun and in the same time with great criticism. Yes. Well, there was a masquerade. When peace broke out in 1749, uh, the king, George II, had a masquerade at the Haymarket Theatre And with an actress friend of hers, everybody went in sort of costume, fancy dress. And she cooked up this outfit, which was Iphigenia from the Greek myth, supposedly. But it was a very sort of sheer flesh-coloured silk, sort of draped with a bit of ivy on it. And when she walked in, to all appearances, it looked as if she was completely naked. And everybody went sort of wild. All the men were absolutely transfixed by this and lots of the women were furious. And a uh, hundred years later, it was still, engravings were still being printed in England of this costume. They vary enormously, actually, these sketchings. It's very hard to work out what it actually looked like, but it was certainly sensational at the time. So she was aware of the fact that she was creating kind of scandal all the time, right? Yeah, she was a terrible old attention seeker, really. Although she was sort of charming and witty and it had got to the stage where she'd completely fallen out with Augustus Harvey, the secret husband. By now, she'd been a maid of honour for years and what normally happened was you were a maid of honour for a bit, you met a husband at court and you went off and you might come back as a lady-in-waiting or you might disappear into some grand life. But she was sort of stuck. And so she made this calculated decision to seek attention. And, and in one way it worked because the king gave her mother a job as housekeeper of Windsor Castle. And her mother didn't have any money. So she got something material out of it. But then at the end of the day, she ended by marrying the Duke, right? She married the Duke, yes. And even if they were quite old, no, they couldn't have children anymore. That's right. I mean, by the time she married him, she was nearly 50. She'd been with him for nearly 20 years. In the end, what prompted the marriage was Augustus Harvey tried to divorce her. And she was so desperate for her name not to be dragged through the courts for adultery, that she came up with this very arcane legal process whereby the courts decided she wasn't married. 
Otherwise, I think she just would have stayed living with the Duke forever. But as it was, she did marry him. And then for four years, they had a very happy time in Nottinghamshire and they went fishing together and she set up an orchestra. She loved music and it was all sort of late in life. And she was very sad not to have any children. But it was rather idyllic. But then he died. And that's when the trouble started, really. There is this large part of the book that is dedicated to a trial, right? Because she goes into a trial, which is a huge event yes. involving the parliament, ministers, the court, all the lords. And this event is um, so much interesting for the press. Yes. And it looks like if the war of the American independence, which was a major fact in international politics, was somehow not as important as this incredible scandal, which was not such a big scandal after all, right? No. Well, I think it's something very interesting. I don't know whether it's international, whether it's in the British psyche, is that it reminds me of when we fell upon royal gossip during talk about Brexit or the coronavirus. And the American War of Independence was much the same. Everybody disagreed. Nobody could decide what to do about it. So in the end, it was a very polarizing issue. And in the end, everyone just got fed up with it. And they sort of fell upon this case because it was much more fun. And the press, I think, were very excited to write about something else. So it is an extraordinary thing. It was really the last minute that peace could have been negotiated. The whole of the House of Lords formed the jury for this trial in Westminster Hall. So they spent hundreds and hundreds of pounds and weeks of time sort of fitting seating into Westminster Hall. It looked like a sort of red amphitheatre. It was covered in red cloth. And 4,000 people crammed in, dressed to the nines in sort of diamonds and their hair done to watch her being humiliated, really. Every peer in the land got seven tickets and a black market opened up and people started selling and reselling them. And Enterprising publishers printed programs saying where people were going to sit and who was going to be in the Queen's box. And the Queen came, even though she was only two weeks off giving birth. And three future monarchs came, the future George III, the future King William, and Queen Victoria's father, James Boswell, Georgina, Duchess of Devonshire, every journalist, every newspaper promised its readers much as they would now that they would feel like they had a front row seat. At the end of the day, the yeah. British people were supporting the Duchess Countess. I mean, they wanted her to be released or they wanted her to be guilty. So there was a newspaper war on, as there always is. So sort of half the newspapers were supporting her and half of them were against her. But in that setting, people started off quite sympathetic, but the House of Lords was very against her because the reason bigamy bothered them so much was, was it uh, affected inheritance. And the thing they didn't want more than anything was sort of unclear bloodlines in the sort of country houses and the great titles of England. But the people on the streets could see that it was very unfair and they rather warmed to her because she was so sort of extravagant and courageous. So there was enormous sympathy for her, unfortunately not amongst the people who were deciding her fate. But her fate, I mean, at the end of the day, she, after a long, she's defending herself brilliantly, but this is not enough and she's uh, condemned. But at the end of the day, she only loses the title of Duchess, right? Yes. yes. She remains a countess. Yes. Because she's still married to the first husband who in the meanwhile became the Count of Bristol. Yes. But she is very shrewd. I mean, she takes all the furniture, all the jewels, all the paintings, and she has this yacht, this big boat, and she escapes yes. with all these belongings to Russia, right? She goes to St. Petersburg. And as you said before, she will become friendly with the famous Potemkin, who is the most powerful man in Russia, and a good friend of the Queen, of the Empress Catherine the Great, right? That's she right. She conquers the Russian scene. But before that, 
she had conquered the Pope and the yes. city of Rome. Yes. Where she also moved with all her belongings and there is the boat arriving in Rome. I mean, this is quite spectacular. That's right. I think, you know, born into another class or another era, she would have been an actress. She really knew how to put on a show and she used the money that the Duke had left her to create attention. So these things were later life versions of that outfit in which she appeared naked. She wasn't going to do that anymore in her 60s, but she got this magnificent boat. But and she was still beautiful in her 60s? She, she was still beautiful. Yeah, she was still beautiful. And depending who you read, she was quite overdressed. So she suited Russia perfectly because she wore beautiful grand clothing, lots and lots of jewellery. So she was very sort of elaborate in her presentation be it herself or her carriages or her boats, you know. So she commissioned this enormous yacht, as we discussed. And the one punishment she'd had was she couldn't use the title, the Duchess of Kingston. And this really bothered her because she really loved this man and she thought this was a great injustice. So she called the boat, as the boat sailed into St. Petersburg, painted on the side was Duchess of Kingston. That's the name she gave to the boat. Yeah, but they kept on calling her Duchess in Russia, right? Yes, yes. She wanted to go somewhere. She was determined to find somewhere they would give her, use her her title, which they didn't everywhere. She tried Vienna, she tried Berlin, and no, they wouldn't receive her because they knew what had happened in England. But Catherine <laughs> the Great didn't really care. I mean, she knew her story, but she was just intrigued. She loved a character. But by the time she was a very wealthy woman, right? A wealthy woman who spent a lot of money, right? Yes. Well, I think because... And, but she, in the meanwhile, that she does all this incredible journey to try to be recognized abroad in exile, uh, she has a lot of legal problems, discussions. I mean, she's involved in intrigues of money and all that all the time, yes. right? Yes. She was sort of on the run, really. She was in self-imposed exile. She'd felt very humiliated in England. But also the reason that she'd been brought to trial was that the Duke's nephews were trying to, felt that if the marriage was shown to be bigamous, then they would get his money, which didn't actually happen because the great British judge, Lord Mansfield, convinced the House of, P the House of Lords that just because she was a bigamist, didn't mean that her husband didn't mean to leave all his money to her. So she still got the money. But then the tap kept being turned on and off by his executors in England, who sometimes the rents were forwarded to her, sometimes they weren't. So it was very difficult, because although legally the money was hers, everyone could so She spent all her life on the edge, right? That's Being right. in this kind of danger, because <laughs> she was never neat, right? Or the That's whole right, such a good life, way of putting it. Uh, a bit shady, right? <laughs> Yes, exactly. I think one of the reasons why she was sort of burning through this money was because she hated these nephews so much who put her in this trial that she wanted to just get through it. So when she died, it would be left to them. And I think she didn't want there to be anything left. So she kept buying property in Paris and Estonia and Russia and spending and spending and spending. But as you say, she was always sort of on the edge. I think she was always sort of seeking protection, another family, really, because she had no children, no husband by now, no siblings, no parents. So I think she was always looking for something that she never quite found, be it in the Pope or Catherine the Great. At the end, uh, what is your feeling about this woman? Because if we look at the story of the woman, she's uh, not particularly interesting because she didn't leave anything. She didn't uh, made great uh, political intrigues. She's not like a Madame de Pompadour or a kind of woman like that. She's just... No, she's not. I mean, she did when leave you, incredible when you wrote, art. When you wrote the book, yes. did you feel sympathy for this woman? Were you very interested in her? Yes, I tell you what, it was two things. I was very interested in her and I felt immense sympathy for her. I was rather intrigued by her sort of chutzpah, really, and the idea of this enormous public humiliation and her determination to recover from it intrigued me. But I was also interested, it was also a way into the period that 
birth of modern Britain and the fact that she was so written about and the idea of this sort of early celebrity. So I wanted to examine sort of how accurate the portrayals were of her and how fair it was that people were very misogynistic and very vicious about her. And as you say, she wasn't a creator. She was a sort of an ephemeral person in a way in that her strength was building relationships and being adventurous. She wasn't, you know, a creator of her own right. But Am I right that in your book you want yeah. also to prove and I don't know how the press reacted to your book, but uh, <laughs> that whatever touches somehow the royal world, which at the time was very powerful and central, today is less. I mean, there were emperors and queens and kings, and yes. even the Pope was different from today. But still, you know, when uh, Meghan and Harry talk in the Ofra television interview, the whole world is watching it, even if we have pandemia, even if there are plenty of other very important things. When the Duke of Edinburgh dies and there is a funeral again, you know, people are curious. You wanted maybe to prove that this kind of frivolous, uh, gossipy stories yeah. are very much loved by people of any yeah. class, of any standard. Yes, because it's a relief somehow exactly. from the tension of bad news, which could have been wars or revolutions or, or pandemias or whatever. Yes. Right? The tragedies of the world. People don't want only that. No. And as you said, they love royalty. They, so they want the mystique and the spectacle of royalty. It's such a relief for them. I would even go to so far as say it's essential. Other, life becomes unbearable without this frivolous, gossipy side, which, as discussed, often isn't particularly frivolous to the person concerned, actually, but to everybody else, serves a, a purpose. In this book, you know, I think you felt sympathy for this uh, Duchess uh, Count, for the Duchess Countess. I did, yes. I because at the end of the day, is similar to the gladiators, you know, the cruelty of the society, upper class society to the street people, you know, all of them who are watching this trial against this woman dressed in black who is accused, you know, and yeah. so like in all the trials, there are people who are against and people who are in favor. And this is lived like a, a show. Yes, there was definitely a sort of bread and circuses element to it. You know, one ageing widow quite alone and the entire British aristocracy, including most of the government, against her. It means that people who break the rules or don't play the rules of the game somehow are punished by society, right? Yes, yes. The Duke of Windsor as much as... The Duchess yes. Countess. Yes. But That's in right. the same time, they become characters. They become object of great curiosity. Yes. And myth, in a way. And after she died, she was written about and written about, as you say, like as the Duke of Windsor is, to the point where she inspires Thackeray, you know, for Vanity Fair. And she acquires this sort of afterlife. Because she wants to be a star, right? I mean, this idea to put together this huge boat with all the belongings and going to yeah. St. Petersburg with musicians, and then there is drama, right? When there is a storm in St. Petersburg, she has to go away, but suddenly there is a storm that destroys the boat. Yes, it didn't quite work out. So there's a wonderful boat after a, this great arrival in St. Petersburg. It was meant to be a sort of two-week triumphant visit and then sail out again. But the worst storm of 18th century St. Petersburg wrecks this boat, which is then lying on a sandbank and has to be repaired by Catherine. And she has to go back overland on this sort of hellish journey. But that didn't make her give up. The next time she came, she managed to get one of the admirals to bring her in on a battleship on the return journey. So she was always finding a backup plan. 
I yeah. suppose one of the things that intrigued me about her was this sort of, it was very rare for a woman who wasn't born a monarch or married to have any form of self actualization She decided what to do. She didn't always get what she wanted, but she did try and control her own destiny. Yeah, and whenever she's put down, she rebounds. For yes. instance, in Calais, now we are into Brexit, right? But <laughs> Calais is the first spot in yes. the continent in France yes. where there is this harbour and this community of expats who live there and she goes into a hotel and they put her in a small room, right? <laughs> But she doesn't seem to fuss. And then the next day they kind of apologize and again they give her a grand apartment or yes. something, you know. Yes. So she's always in this kind of thing. I think you used the word chutzpah, right? Yes. Which is shrewdness in Yiddish, in the sense that uh, she's an adventurer. She's an adventurer, right? yes. But then she also self-indulged in food, in drinking, you know, she had a lot of uh, pleasures. Yes, I think she's a sort of consumer. The 18th century is sort of the beginning of sort of consumerism on a grand scale. And she's a real example of that. So she can't resist. She eats and drinks. She drives everyone nuts because she's always eating and drinking in the theatre and in the opera. And they always say she wears all her jewels all at once. And she's, you know, the buckles on the shoes are priceless diamonds. And she's always sort of wearing this picture of the Electra. She pins it onto her shoulder and then there's a diamond necklace from Augusta and she gets a costume made which she wears which is um, in sort of an imitation of a dress of Cath that belongs to Catherine the Great. But so she's very vulgar in a way, right? She's very vulgar, really. In her excessiveness she's quite vulgar. In her manners she's not, but she can't resist. But with all these so, things she became very fat or something. Yes, or yes she did. I drink. think she just couldn't stop eating and drinking and it was sort of comfort food and she just sort of she's, she's really like a kind of modern yes funny one reviewer said she really minded him of elizabeth taylor the kind of the men the jewels the you know the she undoubtedly would have been wandering around in caftans with a huge diamond on her finger if she'd been living you know in the 20th century so this is what yeah. made her popular in a way right yes i mean it's always difficult to sort of diagnose and slightly risky to try and diagnose somebody in in the past but she reminded me of sort of Lord Byron she had that sort of temperament she reminded you of Lord Byron but <laughs> I don't think she was a poet right no no she wasn't in, the, what is interesting is this kind of Kardashian thing that somebody who does ultimately nothing who is not an artist who's not a writer who's not a politician or a diplomat or something becomes a character becomes a character just, becomes and it's still just because of what she is they become a projection of everybody else's sort of fantasy and interest be it an object of sort of lust or derision or disapproval or sympathy they become a sort of cipher for everybody else But uh, did she really love anyone? Yes, I think she very much loved the Duke of Kingston and she loved her, some of her friends she really loved. She had this cousin who she didn't see for 20 years, but who she wrote to an enormous amount called Belle Chudley and she loved her. She was slightly naive. She was a very forgiving character because the nephew who pursued her and got her into court for bigamy, she was incredibly forgiving of him. She basically ended up paying for his whole life, even though he tried to destroy her. So although she, it was a survival for her, she wasn't sort of vicious at all. She was almost too forgiving, actually. Maybe insecure. Yes, definitely insecure. Insecure and also, in a way, quite religious. I don't know whether it was the guilt of knowing that she was a bigamist, but she's always sort of writing about Christianity in her letters and... Towards the end of her life, she tries to sort of settle the ledger. I think she thinks if she leaves enough money to charity or good causes in Calais or female education or whatever, then she'll sort of come good in the eyes of God. She Frankly, was very, very smart because when she takes all her belonging on the boat, you know, and sails away, in the same time, this overdressed woman... <laughs> 
uh, goes to the trial to Westminster simply dressed in black. Yes. So she knows very well. The power of appearance. The yeah. power of appearance. That's right. And as you were the editor of Tatler, you worked for Vogue, you were the editor of the Evening Standard magazine. Maybe you were fascinated by this person who was an um, ancestor of the world of today, Definitely. the world of appearance. Definitely. One sees the type. And I suppose I feel, you know, history is interesting because we always want to know what's new to our age and what's a constant theme. And she proves that all those sort of Tatler, it girls, all the sort of young royals, they're in a sort of internal breed. Or you mentioned the Kardashians or, you know, in another decade, it would have been Elizabeth Hurley wearing her Versace dress. It's sort of or Lady Gaga in one of her amazing outfits. It is a... A constant theme. So yes, I was drawn to it because of that. So after all, you think that you gave life and birth again to this (laughs) character that you call the Duchess Countess, because after all, you think all this is quite contemporary. I do. I think it's very contemporary. I think in a way, she's like somebody from our age, which we think is of our age, but is actually for all time. Even if we are in Zoom today, which we wouldn't have been before, you think that after all, the world hasn't changed much. I do, I do. The press and the gossip is just, as we hear on social media now, this sort of echo chamber effect, the constant assessment. So you think that if the Duchess Countess would have been born recently and she was here today, she would be anyway a kind of celebrity? Yes, probably. I mean, her choices were limited. So she was early in choosing that kind of famous for being famous route. But And what do you think? She would dress Gucci? She would dress, <laughs> you know, something very Versace, you know, this kind of very yes, clean we, fashion? I think Versace, Gucci, very, yes, very colourful, very glamorous. And what kind of jewellery she would have? Let's think. I think real, I think real sort of rocks like Elizabeth Taylor. You know, we're talking sort of competitive diamond sizing. This is something that excited Andy Warhol, right? <laughs> yeah. So she could be like another a pop character somehow. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Although, of course, okay. you know, diamonds then, like Casanova crossed Europe with little pockets of diamonds they're a brilliant form of mobile currency then who did this casanova oh, casanova right so just saying diamond jewelry then also had this so other another, an- another yeah. thing that is endless yes is the diamond yes so maybe for the many people who are in love with boats and yachts and sailing because in this book there are boats what is Odd is that the husband, the Count of Bristol, is a sailor, right? And he moves into boats and goes to Cuba, he goes everywhere. And uh, where did she purchase her boats? Even she makes two different boats. Yes, she does. Well, the first one, I think, was built by her, by the Duke of Kingston. The first one was the Minerva. And although his estate in Nottinghamshire was inland, it had this enormous lake and he had all these boats on it. And it was said that when you looked at his lake, it looked like he had a navy. So he was obsessed with ships as well. But the (laughs) second one, she commissioned herself in the docks in London and she had it built and she got somebody to draw it and it was made to her specification. So she probably knew that she would have had to sail away. Yes. The drawings, actually, the fascinating drawings, they're in terrible condition, but they still survive. They're in the Royal Naval College in Greenwich and they show this sort of beautiful, you know, windows and this decoration and the gold and the state saloon, which... Now, we have heard a lot about the Duchess of Devonshire, right? Yes. As a big sure. character yes. of the popular literature and so on and so forth. Yes. You think this character now is as brilliant, as flamboyant as 
the Duchess of Devonshire. Funnily enough, the Duchess of Devonshire came to her trial. I know, uh, I know. As a very young married woman, yes. What they have in common is they're both society women who fall prey to great scandal. I mean, in other ways, I suppose they're quite different in that Elizabeth Chudley didn't come from such a grand background as Georgina and her humiliation is so much greater. But equally, I feel that her type is more enduring because, not that it's a competition, but if we look at the Becky Sharps of this world, there is something endlessly compelling about a woman trying to get on through any means at her disposal. To fulfil her ambition, right? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Loved it. Okay. It was such a good talk. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Alan L. Can interviews.